Hello. Hi, Kelsey. How's it going? Good. How are you? Oh, fine. I owe you a PowerPoint. It's ready. I'll send it to you. <laughs> okay. I went back and saw the email and I was like, oh, she wanted that. So oh, you are okay. totally fine. It's okay. Because I can just share my screen, right? Yep. Do I have the permissions to do that? Yeah, let me, I think I added you, but let me double check here. Make co-host. Should be good to go. Appreciate that. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Good. I was so excited to see your name on the list of attendees. I'm moving into a new job. I've heard. Congratulations. <laughs> we'll see, because I have two this fall. So, yes. Yeah. I think I think there's a good number of us straddling that. So let's see how yes. we vote, how we all do, right? There you go. There you go. Kelsey, is there like a, whenever you're ready, do you do a sort of a start or? Yep, I'll introduce you once we, I'll give it another minute here because I think we have a couple more people joining and then I'll introduce you and then you can take it over. Great. Okay, it looks like we have most of the people who registered. So if you don't know me, my name is Kelsey Meyer. I'm the senior admin over here in the Center for Faculty Excellence. And today we have Chris Bullins here who is going to be talking to us about the academic honesty policy and how that works at Bowling Green State University. Thanks, Kelsey. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm already off to a good start, right? Because I'm unmuted. I hate to be the person who people are like, you're still on mute. Uh, but as Kelsey said, my name is Chris Bullins. I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of Students at BGSU. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And in addition to serving as the Dean of Students, I also serve as the Academic Honesty Coordinator. Uh, I was so excited to see the number of people that signed up for today's session. I know it's offered as part of new faculty orientation, but I also saw that it was offered to the campus community for returning faculty uh, who wanted to join. So thank all of you who are here with us. If you're new to the university, it's my pleasure to be a part of the many people who have probably already said, welcome to our Falcon family. Uh, it's definitely an exciting time to be here. And if there's anything that I can do to support you, please let me know. Uh, I normally, right, as a good student affairs professional would say, let's do introductions. Uh, but I don't wanna do that today uh, for a couple of reasons, right? There's a lot of us, it's hard to do on, on Zoom, but I would love if you wouldn't mind in the chat, if you, wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind just throwing out your name and the department you're in, and if you're new to BG or returning, uh, so that others can see who's here, I'm going to post a quick piece to the chat, uh, because one of the other things that I'm going to do throughout the year with the Center for Faculty Excellence is offer some workshops uh, around our community of care, which I think is a very important initiative that we've launched to help make sure that our faculty, our staff, and our students are, are healthy and safe and well. And so if you've not already gotten the printed uh, file folder for the community of care, um, the link that I gave you is to the PDF for it. And I just think it's a really great resource for all of our employees to have, because I know each and every one of us is committed to uh, the safety and well-being of our students and our colleagues. So I'm gonna turn off the chat feature for me only so that I don't get distracted by it, but please keep that going. Uh, if you have a question, you know, I will certainly allow time at the end, but you can feel free to interrupt me if you would like, or if you're like, hey, I'm going to hang out to the end because maybe he's going to talk about it. That is great, too. So I'm going to start sharing my screen with you. Uh, today, I get the opportunity to talk with you 
about our academic honesty uh, policy and process at BGSU. And this is again, uh, the academic honesty coordinator role is something that I have been in I'm, I'm starting year two. So what is it that I wanna cover with you? Uh, well, we're off and running with the introductions part. I really appreciate all of you that are participating. And again, I, I can't tell you enough how excited I am that each of you is here. I thought we would cover the, the topic in this way. Um, number one, I, I would introduce you at, at a high level to some of us call it the academic honesty policy. Some of us call it the code of academic conduct, potato, potato, whatever is more comfortable for you. Uh, wanting to really spend some time in the process. So uh, how does the process work from beginning to end? I uh, wanted to offer you some tips and strategies, especially that I have come to, I've, I've come to appreciate much more uh, as we're coming out of COVID, uh, but as we made the shift to online learning uh, as, as a more pronounced environment, it definitely created some phenomenal opportunities, but it presented some challenges. And I, and I just would like to offer some lessons learned that maybe you would want to adopt and then wanna make sure that you know who to call if you have a question about academic honesty, and then I wanna take any questions that you have. So the policy, um, I encourage you to, to locate it, to bookmark it in your free time to maybe take a read of it. It's not a horribly long document, it's 11 pages. Uh, it's available out on our website as part of our student handbook. But it is a dense document in that um, the way it is written maybe is not the way I would have written it. I believe the document's probably three-ish decades old at this point because it is part of the academic charter, which means to change it requires a vote of the Board of Trustees, and then before that, the Faculty Senate, and then before that, a good number of committees. So as you can imagine, I think the governance process alone is is maybe part of the reason why we haven't done some updates, but I, I would like to, to take that on at some point. So what is it that the code prohibits? There are, there are six things uh, in there that students are not permitted to do. I've highlighted for you in bold the sort of the big three uh, with the top two clearly at the top, right? The most common violations that we see of the code involve cheating and or plagiarism with a slightly distant third being facilitating academic dishonesty. I'm very happy to say that the last three, especially given how severe they could be, are just things that I rarely, rarely see, right? We don't see students uh, altering their grade, forging a signature, trying to threaten or bribe you, or making up data, et cetera. Uh, but these are the six prohibited types of conduct. Uh, the definitions that I provided for you there are straight from that, that code. And I do wanna make sure that everybody knows um, and that our students know that just because they maybe didn't go out and find the code, they didn't read the code, they say they, they didn't know it existed, that is not a defense uh, for engaging in such conduct. Okay, so then the meat of today, the process and, and how things work, right? So should you ever discover in an academic exercise that you have assigned that you believe one of those behaviors has happened, that someone has cheated or plagiarized? And I'm going to show you in a minute the sanctions, right? But you as the instructor, according to our policy, have jurisdiction when it is the student's first offense and when the outcome would not be their dismissal their suspension, or their expulsion from the university. How will you know that? Well, you actually won't, right? Because we keep the prior records centralized, and we certainly would never want anyone to be predisposed to that, to develop an opinion or a bias about a student early on. So the process is set up in a way that no matter what the outcome is, you're still going to do the same thing, but where the ending of the case actually lands might be a little different if one of those uh, sanctions is warranted or if it is a second or more offense. So given that your process doesn't change regardless, let's walk through it. So you assign an activity, an exercise, the students turn it in on a Friday, it's fall break, so you decide to wait till Tuesday to start grading. 
That's okay, right? You, you, you had the weekend time there. From the moment that you discover what you believe to be a violation, you have five class days in order to make what the policy says is a good faith effort to meet with the student. I would highly recommend that you diversify the ways that you reach out. I'd send an email, I'd maybe send a notification to them through Canvas. I would maybe, if they're in class, say, hey, could you stay after? I think the more different ways that you try and that you document that, it's only going to help you. So making a good faith effort to meet with the student within five class days. When that meeting happens, it's your opportunity to be very direct with the student of, hey, this assignment you turned in last Friday, I was grading it on Tuesday. I've come across a section where I believe that you plagiarized. I'm going to lay this paper down in front of you, or if we're meeting by Zoom, I'm going to show it to you on my screen. This is the section that I caught. This is the problem that I have with it, right? You're very much giving them notice of, of what happened and why you're concerned. And then the other part of the meeting is to give the student the opportunity to be heard. Maybe they have a reason for whatever happened. So allowing them to tell you their version of what happened. The policy also allows that you give the student two class days after that meeting to go home and reflect and potentially come back to you or to send you additional information or evidence. So um, again, whatever that is that might prove the case that they're making, they are then able to give you. And then you have to decide, right? So within five class days of having met with the student, or if the student then has failed your outreach opportunities, you're gonna to need to make a decision. Do you believe that it is more likely than not, that's the preponderance of the evidence, so if it were all things equal and a feather was on the scale, does it tip you to believe that a student engaged in a violation of one or more of those prohibited items? If you do not think that they did, then no additional action is needed and you could follow up with the student and let them know that. However, if you decide that a violation did occur, and if there's any returning faculty on our meeting, this is a time you wanna perk your ears up a little bit because we're making a change in how the flow works. What you will do at that point is we have a website called BGSU See It, Hear It, Report It. You go to it and there's a, a, a link to different things, a Title IX violation, a hazing violation, a student of concern, and then now there's an academic honesty violation form. You would click on that form and it prescribes the questions that we need you to answer for us. And that form is actually out there and live and I will pull it up in just a minute and we'll look at it. So you fill out the form again within five days of having met with the student or not being successful through your outreach. And at that point you hit submit. Now, again, when we look at the form in a minute, it's gonna ask your information, the student's information, your attempts to reach them. It's gonna ask you to upload a PDF of, of the paper or the academic exercise where the violation occurred. It's gonna ask you to upload anything they gave them. And then it's gonna ask you what the sanction would be that you would give in this situation. And again, we'll talk about sanctions in a minute. And then when you hit submit, that's gonna to go to the necessary people on the back end. And ultimately the student will be emailed a letter that will be signed off on by their college office, not your college, but their college that tells them they've been found responsible for cheating in math 2020, and the outcome of that is a five point reduction on the assignment or a zero on the exam, right? And then they're notified of that. And then in that letter, they have the opportunity to appeal. Okay. So I'm gonna stop for just a minute and let that sit with you. Is this the same process for grad students and undergrads? It is, Crystal. Hey, it's great to see you. And a matter of fact, maybe while we're pausing, I will pull up 
the new form. Because again, for those of you who've been here for a while, right, it used to be all this email back and forth. Crystal, since you were nice enough to talk to me, is what's showing up now um, my uh, uh, a website? Yep. Okay, I want to make sure it was showing and not the PowerPoint. So here is the See It Here it Reported page. I'm going to work to get it moved up. <laughs> but as you can see, we've got a number of forms. So right now you're the bottom one on the left. I'll get you moved higher. But when you go to it and you click on it, then it simply asks for things like your name, your role. So are you, what type of instructor are you? Uh, some contact information, the class, when you met with the student or the last time that you tried, the student, were they a witness in the case or were they the person that, that broke the policy? What's their ID number? And then, right, uh, it, was there any other instructor involved? What was it that they did? So all of the prohibited conduct is there in the definition. And then, so you check the box and then, you know, what was it that you saw that caught your attention and why was it a problem? How did the conversation with the student go? Did they tell you or give you anything back? And then after all this, what have you decided? They're gonna get a W or a WF or an F or a WF in the course. You're gonna give them a reduction of points or other. And then if you selected partial or other, please fully describe that so that we know what you mean. And then attach your documents and hit submit. So that's the, that's the form that you would fill out. Okay, so now let me hop back to my PowerPoint. And again, is that what's showing for us, Crystal? Yes, it is. Crystal's like, I'll never ask a question again, but I <laughs> no, know Crystal. So thank you so much. All right, so now let's, let's make a hop. Oh, go ahead. This is for any any violation, like because we wouldn't know if it was a first violation, a second violation. Okay. Yeah, because when you hit submit and it comes to us, we then will look and go, actually, this is someone's second offense or someone's third offense. And then, right, so actually, oh, I forgot I inserted this slide for you. So you may be asking yourself at this point, right? So as I'm trying to decide, what do I do? What are the sanctions that I could give? Well, here they are. According to the policy, an instructor of record can reduce credit. So you could take a half point off, five points off, a complete zero, uh, no credit for the one question. Like it's very, very open there for you. The absolute most severe sanction that could be given is an F in the course. The other sanctions, suspension, dismissal, expulsion, are things that are done at the student's academic college level. Okay. So when you're thinking about sanctions, here is something that I would urge you to consider, right? Beyond the fact that things are pretty punitive, right? You're going to lose some points, you're going to get a zero on the whole thing, or you're going to get an F. What might you infuse that could help them learn and not come back here? Is it that you want them to go meet with someone in the learning commons to learn how to cite? <laughs> Is it you want them to write a one-page paper about citing and plagiarism and turn it back into you to show that they've mastered the concept? What are some creative things that you might be able to add to it so that it's not simply a punitive approach? Because at the end of the day, right, we're in the business of educating and developing. Some other things you might want to just factor in is, you know, um, while the student may tell you, I didn't know about any of this, and that doesn't excuse it, if they genuinely maybe have not, they're early in their academic career, they've not taken a writ class yet, it's obvious that they're coming out of high school where there wasn't a strong emphasis on citing. Does, does that impact at all someone whose intent was clearly, I've got a D in the class, I've got to get a C, I knew what I was doing, right? I, I was coming into this with a lot of intentionality because I've really got to pass this class. Do they own it? You know, it, does it matter to you that someone is like, 
yep, I see what you're saying. I, I, I clearly made that mistake. It is my fault um, or not. And then, you know, are they able to understand the impact that how it impacts others in the class to have a competitive advantage? And so just in your conversation with them, what are things that they're saying that might lead you toward one sanction or another? So what happens if it's not the first offense? Well, we would find that out after you submitted the form. And at that point, we know that it needs to be escalated to the student's academic college. Therefore, you're gonna have followed the exact same process. But instead of getting a letter from the college that says, Kelsey, you cheated in math 2020 and the penalty is a C on the midterm, it would say, Kelsey, you've been alleged of cheating in math 2020. However, because this is a second offense, I need to convene a hearing with you and you need to schedule that hearing. Each of our colleges handle those hearings. Most often they're inviting the instructor of record because it is a hearing. It's an opportunity for both parties to present their information and to be heard. And when that hearing happens, it is that dean or their designee that makes the decision. Was there a violation here or not? And what's gonna be the outcome? And because at that point, they could be upholding your uh, allegation, but they could come up with a different sanction or they could be overturning your allegation, you now are a party in the case that has the right to appeal. So they're gonna send the outcome letter again, just like they would have the first time. The first time you're gonna be copied on it as an FYI, but this time you're gonna be notified as a party and you as a party, just like the student, will have an opportunity to appeal. And again, a reminder, right, that at the college level, for second offenses and, and on, they're going to be considering a suspension, a dismissal, or an expulsion. Now, what I have found a good number of colleges do, so I want to prepare you, is if it is the student's second offense, and there were a lot of the things that we talked about said in the hearing that, that I ask you to consider, right? Uh, the college may decide to not invoke removal on the second offense. So they use the language suspended sanction. And a lot of times then what they'll do is say, okay, Kelsey, you should have been suspended for a year because it's your second offense. But I'm gonna suspend that sanction and I'm gonna uphold the decision that Trinka or Crystal made in the class. So you are going to get a C on the midterm. And if you come back for a third violation and you're found responsible, whatever you get there, this one year suspension will be added to it. So some colleges definitely do a three strikes versus a two strikes that you're out. And that's why having you follow the same process is important because they're going to want to know what you would have done had it been your jurisdiction. So again, that's why we have you handle everything the same, and then we treat it differently on the back end if it is a second offense or, or more, okay? So how do appeals work? Well, this is where my role starts to come in. So in addition to building the Maxient forms and being keeper of the database, I'm the coordinator of the Academic Honesty Committee, and it has jurisdiction in all, appell all appellate matters. So whether it's the first offense, the second, or the third, when the party or parties appeal, they're appealing to the Academic Honesty Committee. This is a university-wide committee that has 30 members. The seven, I get in trouble for saying this sometimes, I call them line colleges, right? But what I mean is that honors and the library are not included, but the other seven colleges each get to appoint two faculty 
And then the faculty senate elects and or appoints four more. That's how we get to 18. And then the undergraduate and graduate student governments appoint their students. And so this committee is 30 people. My job is to make sure we've got a full roster to train them, to answer questions for them and support them. So what happens is if a party wants to appeal in that notification letter that they're gonna get from the Dean's office, there's gonna be a link that says, click here to appeal. And it's gonna open a form that feels very much like that see it here reported form. It's gonna ask your name, it's gonna ask your role, it's gonna ask what grounds you're appealing on. It's gonna say, if you're appealing for this reason, give me justification. It's gonna allow you to upload artifacts and then to submit it. That has to be done within seven class days of the notification letter going out. There's also gonna be an option on that form for the party to click a box at the top of the form to say, I'm good with this and I waive any right to appeal. I don't need this to go on any longer. So the link to that form will be in the outcome letter. Notice that a reason that a person cannot appeal is about the severity of the sanction unless it went above the minimum. So if an instructor tried to suspend a student or if a college wanted to expel on a second offense, then those are not appropriate within the minimum maximums. And that would be a reason to appeal. But otherwise it has to be based on one or more of these reasons. When the committee gets an appeal, we load it into Canvas, we tell them it's there, they look at everything, and then all 30 of them get to vote. Has the person who appealed gave us enough that we wanna hear more through a hearing, or are we denying a hearing? If a hearing is denied, then the party or parties have one last level of appeal, and that's directly to the provost's office, to Dr. Whitehead's office, within seven days, and the only reason for an appeal is a procedural error. If a hearing is granted, then from the 30, we pull quorum and we meet via Zoom. And at the outcome of that hearing, the student is there, the instructor of record is there, one of three things can happen. The committee can uphold the decision that's been made by the instructor or the dean or designee, they can overturn the decision, or they could suspend or modify the sanction that was imposed. And then we will owe you an outcome letter from the hearing. And again, there's that same appeal to the provost for procedural error that the parties have the right to do. So, Wanna, I'm gonna be brave for a minute, right? I'm gonna do things that I try to tell people in Zoom meetings not to do. I'm gonna get out of this for a minute and I wanna show you something I'm working on because that was a lot, right? So under the current day, you would go to the policy, read this. Hopefully it would make sense. If it didn't, you would call somebody, we would answer your questions. Over the summer, I've been working on some things that were really close to launching. So one of them is on the Dean of Students website, at, we're gonna be adding on the left nav an, applicant, an academic honesty tab. There's never been a website before for this. So we're gonna have a website that's gonna link you to the code. It's gonna tell everybody what they can't do and there's gonna be drop downs for definitions. Then it's gonna have a little paragraph about who has jurisdiction. And then it's gonna have some FAQs. And then I'm working on some little two or three video, two or three minute video clips to also explain some things. Now, right here under resolving the cases, we're going to put in two big bubbles or call out buttons. And when you click on them, it's going to take you to a flowchart. So everything that I just told you that is so dense is going to be captured in a if I have jurisdiction, what do I do? do, 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 do. And then if the Dean has jurisdiction, what is it that happens? 
And so my hope is that between the website, the flow charts, the videos, moving things into Max Hint where you're, you're being asked very specific things, that this is gonna make this whole process a lot easier than the days of going to a PDF and then emailing people. So let me pause for just a minute because what I was about to do then is talk about like, so can a student stay in the class if they've been accused? But are there immediate questions or comments about the ground we've covered so far? Okay, Kelsey, I'm back to process, right? Awesome, okay. So does a student get to stay or go during this whole situation? Per the policy, the student must be permitted to stay in that class until all of the appeal process has been worked through. In order to keep them from dropping it and trying to sort of run from the situation, right? And be like, well, if I just drop the class, there won't be any ramifications. The minute that you all submit that violation form, the very first thing, the registrar's office will insert a grade of NGR or no grade received. So if a student logs into their MyBGSU, they're gonna have a grade in your class week three if they were accused of cheating of an NGR. That grade keeps them from being able to drop the class. And it will stay there until the end of the semester. If the student wants to drop the class, there is a way to do that. But number one, the case has to be completed. They have to say, you know what? I was accused, I was caught, and I don't wanna appeal, right? I'm done with this thing and the outcome could not have been an F in the class. And if all that is occurring before the drop deadline for the class, then the college will let them drop it, but it will still be flagged as an academic honesty issue, even with the W, meaning that we will know that the next time is still their second offense. I think there's been some real confusion that students have thought, if week one, I got accused of cheating, I lost five points on a quiz. The first test, I get an F. The midterm, I get an F. I don't want an F. Can I get out of this class? Some people have said, no, because you have an NGR, you've got to ride this out. And that is not the case. So how does the NGR go away? Well, unfortunately, you will not get to report a grade at the end of the semester for that, system, for that student. The NGR will be there. So you will actually get an, uh, an ask from the student's college, what should the grade be? Because there's a grade change form that, that currently has to be handwritten and signed. Some of them may send that to you. Some of them may simply email you and say, so back to Kelsey, right? What should Kelsey's grade in the class be? And then you would need to report that to them. And then they take care of the NGR for you. Okay, so what are some preventative strategies? What, what have we learned through COVID and, and just hearing a lot of appeals? Well, number one, and, and, and this one's maybe a, a, a given, right? But the more time that you spend talking about academic honesty, how important it is to you and your class, uh, things you need them to know, expect them to know, will tolerate, will not tolerate, language in the syllabi, like we all know, right? Prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so I think that's really important. The second thing we've learned is about this online stuff. So if any of you have used or are thinking of using, uh, BGSU bought something called Respondus Lockdown Browser. And basically it is um, when students have the lockdown browser on because you have made it a part of your quiz or, or your uh, exam, it's recording them take the exam on their laptop. So they have to have a computer that has a camera. And this browser is going to, it has an algorithm and a warning sign if the student is looking away too much. 
So if they're looking down, if they're looking up, if they're looking over, it's going to flag for you students who had too much abnormal eye contact or movement. I cannot tell you how many students have appealed over a lockdown browser situation, and they've said things like, nobody told me I need to do an environmental scheme. Well, what is an environmental scheme? At the very start, lockdown browser respondents will tell them this, but they can skip it. <laughs> an environmental scan is where they're supposed to pick up their laptop. Here we go for a ride, everybody. And they're supposed to do an entire 360 scan of the room to let you see what's on their desk, what's on their walls, who's in the room. Some people want it done first and at the end of the assignment. But our students, because they can skip that little orientation by respondus, don't take it seriously. So if you're going to really rely on respondus, take a few minutes and tell them how critical this is. Show them what an environmental scan is. Help them understand. And tell them if they don't do it. If they don't do it at all, or they don't do a correct one, what the, the outcome is going to be. And so let me tell you what I was seeing in appeals, right? I'm seeing students who say, I have anxiety. And so when I've read a question and my mind is wondering, I will look down and pick at my fingernails. And it means I'm thinking about what to say. But because they didn't do the environmental scan and they were looking down for two minutes, the instructor thought they were looking at a textbook or their phone and they accused them of cheating. And so these are the real things that are happening. The other thing we saw a lot of is for some students, they said, I need to do it. I need a blank piece of paper that maybe I'm doing the math on, maybe I'm just drawing a flower, but my brain, I need to be doing two things, right? I need to be thinking about your question and doodling. Is scratch paper allowed? Is it okay as long as you saw it in the environmental scan? And so really helping them understand those things. Uh, it, I, I, I can tell you that will save so, that will be so important for you. The other thing is some opportunities to potentially mitigate this, right? So I think for some people, they're like, well, yeah, you just have to take the quiz before a certain date. Well, what other people found is potentially setting a time limit that's long enough, but not too long versus just a due date. For other people, it was rethinking the questions that they use. So rather than multiple choice, having questions that require some higher order thinking, things where they've got to be synthesizing material, they can't just go out and find something on the internet to answer it. And then there's some features in Canvas that can help you ensure that each student is getting their own version of the quiz or the test so that Kelsey and I aren't texting each other, right? 1C, 2D, 3B. Well, no, we, we both have a different version of that exam, so we can't be working together because she doesn't know what question I'm on, and I don't know what question she's on. The contacts for our process, um, I put two up here. Uh, I am always willing to talk with you or a student at any time. Uh, and then in McFall, in the provost office, is where Kim works. Kim supports both Sarah Bouchon, who's our Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, and she supports me. So she's the person who pushes a lot of the paperwork, but she has really good knowledge about the process. And then as I told you, this new website is going to be coming online very soon. The other thing I would say is don't discount more seasoned faculty in your department, your department chair, your dean's office. They are all really great resources and able to help you. And so with that, because this, again, was a very technical presentation, I wanted to, to be able to allow some good time for questions or discussion. Chris, this is Trinka. Um, I'm curious, are we allowed to have a copy of your PowerPoint? I couldn't write fast enough. Absolutely. I, thank you. I, matter of fact, I was supposed to send it to Kelsey in advance, so she'll get it in a minute. Okay, thank you very much.
Great question. And I'll open my chat back up. So Kim is asking, uh, do we have issues with faculty not reporting? Yes. And to be honest with you, I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why I think that is, but others feel free to chime in. I think we've not always done the best job educating all of you about the policy. I think before we sort of left you like go read it and then, oh, by the way, the person you need to email that this happened is the student's academic dean. So you got to find what college they're in. You got to look up the person. You got to email. So I think for some people, the, the process was burdensome, right? So either a lack of knowledge or burdensome. And then I just think some folks think, well, you know, if I just handle this with the student, it's enough. And what I would urge you to think about is two things. Number one, we want centralized conduct database to know that someone is a repeat offender so that progressive discipline can happen. But the other thing is you never want to be put in a situation of being accused of a quid pro quo, right? So it, I, I cheated, but you were willing to, to go lighter on me if I did some favor for you. And so by just reporting and working through the policy, you're not put in a situation where you're accused of, uh, of, of unethical conduct. Uh, do we have access to, uh, is it flag scan or similar services? I'm gonna have to ask my faculty colleagues or Kelsey here. I'm not aware of that one. Yes, I just can't remember the name of it. I have some folks who make their students submit through that on a larger paper. And so they see it ahead of time because it's real color coded. I would have to get you that name, I'm sorry. And then are there any advice on the use of uh, turn it in uh, similar tips for the browser blocker. Uh, again, any of my colleagues have, have worked, have, have had an experience there? Maybe Kim or Todd, would you be able to, what is turn it in? That was actually what I was talking about, Todd. That's what my faculty use. Okay, yeah, it's software that, that scans a document that's turned in for plagiarism or lack of citations of other people's work or information. So do we have access to that here? We were told it was available and uh, could be used. I think it's a, like an extension through Canvas when people turn in, but I just didn't know if you had any guidance or I've never used it before. So just looking for if there was any advice there. I was going to say that, oh, sorry, Don, I saw her hand up. I use it for all of my papers. It is through Canvas. It's when you're setting up the assignment. Um, so when you create the assignment and they have to submit a document, it works best with like Word, I think. I'm not sure if it works as good with PDF, but um, they submit their document and it's a checkbox that you can select and it'll scan that document. Um, you do have to look at it it like when you go into the grader on canvas and you're doing the um oh where you can see the actual assignment there's a it, it'll give it a score it'll flag it with like blue is is like zero green is like there's not very much crossover red is like really bad and you can click on that you can actually go in and see the things that the software is highlighting uh, but you have to use it with a grain of salt, like anything under 30 percent, I'd kind of ignore because uh, it's just going to flag some random things. Like even if they have their references listed out, it'll flag their references and um, things like that. Um, and some of them you might have to see what it is highlighting and say has been copied and then like Google it yourself because it'll just tell you that it flags to another paper or um, something like that. You can't really see, you can't really see what it's flagging to. So like if I think there's a big issue, I'll take the phrase that it's saying has been copied and I'll Google it and I'll find more information about it that way than through the turn it in. Mm -hmm. Hi, Crystal. Haven't seen you in a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Crystal that you have to kind of evaluate uh, the responses. You know, is it green or is it yellow? Because it, you really do have to make some de individual decisions on that. Uh, the one thing I wanted to say is if a student 
resubmits a paper, say they uh, submitted it early before the deadline and then decided to resubmit, turn it in or show it won't be accurate. Oh, I also wanted to add, and I apologize, I can't remember the specific button that it is when you're on Turnitin, but there is a button that you can hit in that review area, and it will direct you to either the web page that the student might have uh, copied material from, or if the student reused a paper in another one of their BGSU classes, you, you're able to download that and then say that the student um, used one of their friends paper from the University of Toledo, there's a process through Turnitin as well where you can request that manuscript from that student's instructor uh, to use in whatever um, meeting or reporting that the instructor has to go through. Don, I'm glad you mentioned rough draft because that triggered another trend that I've seen this year. Uh, so students would appeal and they would come to me and here's the story they would offer. My professor, the papers due at the end of the semester, but we were able to submit rough drafts along the way. The first one I turned in, or maybe the second one, I had done substantial research and put it in there, but I wasn't at the stage yet of citing. And I didn't know that turning in the rough draft, I was going to get accused of plagiarism. And so again, I think helping your students understand if you're going to accept multiple iterations of drafts, at what point do you expect to see citations and how would you treat rough drafts related to plagiarism? Some people believe from step one, if you're gonna give me something, even if it's a paragraph and there's one sentence in there that's not yours, it needs to be cited now. Other people see that the student made a note, right? Like cite, they're like, okay, they're gonna go back to that before the final work product. And that got a good number of students tripped up this year. Other questions or comments? Okay, so Kelsey, maybe before I just turn it back over to you, if I could end with again, I'm so glad all of you were here. Thank you for taking the time. If I can partner with you, your department, your college on any of this, let me know. But the other part of my job as Dean of Students involves a lot of things around non-academic misconduct, students of concern, whether we think someone could be a threat of harm to themselves or others, or someone's experiencing food or housing insecurity, uh, a student's experiencing some mental health challenges, um, a student death or a death in the family, sending faculty absence notifications out. So my office, as you can imagine, interacts with students a lot. And we really want to be your partner. So at any point that you're dealing with an issue at, at my office and you don't understand something, call us. But more importantly, between the faculty and the RAs, you all see the majority of the students that are on this campus, right? We have a two-year live-on requirement. So almost 90% of our first-year students will live in the residence halls. And if, and if all of our faculty and all of our students, if, if you're concerned about someone, if you would report that, I think we could go a long way in making sure that people who maybe are struggling with something get the help that they need. And so I would just encourage you that at any point that a student's on your radar and you're worried about something, to say something. And, and you can do it through that see it here at report it form. If it's an emergency, calling 911, but you can always pick up the phone and we are happy to consult with you because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, right? Our students healthy, safe, and succeeding. And so Again, I just look forward to partnering with you in, in any way that I can. Thank you so much, Chris. This was really great and informative. Uh, we have been recording this session, so it'll be posted on the CFE YouTube page in case anyone wants to reference it again later. I am going to drop in the chat a link to the workshop evaluation. If you guys could complete that, it will take maybe a minute and all responses are anonymous. But thank you guys so much for joining us today. And we have almost 30 workshops at the CFE this August. So 
feel free to uh, visit our website and they're all listed on the homepage. So thank you guys so much. Bye.